Welcome to Wilhelm and another edition of the Spotlight Series. I'm your host, Ben Beck, and this is the final episode of the year. That's right, the final episode of 2022. I'm going to be taking a little break over the Christmas holiday to spend some time with my friends, my family, uh, as well as finish up on some new things brewing for the podcast. Uh, but don't worry, I'll be back with brand new episodes January 2023. <clears throat> Excuse me, already. Um, all new top five series, all new amazing guests for the Spotlight series, and so much more. So make sure you're keeping an eye on the socials for all of that. But as I mentioned, final episode of 2022, and I'm so excited uh, to be ending the year with this gentleman. He's an actor, voice actor, who you would know from so many different projects. But if you're like me, <clears throat> you'd know him most uh, from two. The first being Ralph Macchio's partner in falsely accused crime, uh, it's, uh, Stan Rothenstein from My Cousin Vinny, and of course, as Dr. Barry Farber, DDS, in the hit show Friends, please welcome to the spotlight, Mitchell Whitfield. <laughs> oh, thank you for having me. Now I feel that for the last one of the year, there's a certain pressure that goes along with that, which I'm going to try and work through, but I, I think we'll be okay. Thank you for having me, man. This is awesome. No, I appreciate you coming on. I mean, a little bit of backstory as to how we got connected was you were doing an appearance at Rhode Island Comic Con. Yep. Uh, and a good friend of mine, my friend Jill, was actually you know one of the volunteers at the show, and she was working with you that weekend, and she made this connection between the two of us. And thank you, Jill. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, go. Jill. Little, little love for Jill. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, I was so excited. She sent me the picture of the two of you together, and I immediately knew who you were. And and I was uh, I was excited, especially when she said that you know she she talked me up to you about doing the podcast, and you were more than willing to do it. And here of we are. Of course, of course, of course. Happy to do. I'm glad she didn't say kind of a jerk, but I think you'll have fun. <laughs> Just like his character on Friends, kind of a jerk, but you'll have fun. You know what though? Awful. Yeah. If that, it, but if that were true, I probably still would have had you on. No, of course you would have, because that would even make, make for better video, better, better interview, better everything. Absolutely. So yeah. which is sad because we don't want to incentivize bad behavior, but sometimes <laughs> it does make for more compelling shows. You know what I mean? Yeah. Unfortunately. Exactly. Uh, but yeah, I mean, she met you at Rhode Island Comic Con, which I mean, it always surprises me. And it's a, and in a great way when I find out certain actors are doing con appearances that I never knew were doing con appearances. How long have you been doing con circuits for? Is it relatively new? Have you been doing it for a while? I will tell you this. So in the past, in terms of cons i've done uh new york comic-con a couple of times and san diego comic-con twice i think i've done each of them twice but that was when we were being sent by the studio to promote whatever i was working on mm -hmm. i think it was transformers robots in disguise at the time maybe one other thing i was promoting at the time but as far as like me going to a con to do signings uh this is my first one in probably years and years okay i've done private signings before but going to a con like this just to you know do signings for fans i, I don't think i've done that in a really really long time so no i'm not on the circuit and i i probably will do a few more of them i don't i know i have a lot of friends that do them you know every month they're going a couple of different places and they're over oh, this we're going to cincinnati and we're going to buffalo and they're these great cons and by the way rhode island comic-con is amazing i had no idea that it was such a huge <laughs> amazing show i was blown away by it uh, but I have a lot of friends who do them a lot. I probably won't be doing them a lot, but I still would like to do them every once in a while because it's, in, you know, yeah, personally, it's fun for me. But at the same time, it's great to meet with fans that wouldn't otherwise have an opportunity to talk with me and me talk with them and get to share experiences and hear what they want to hear about. And I think that was the most fun part of it, Ben, was that people were there. Yeah, I was signing autographs and stuff, but people were asking questions about movies or TV shows that I've been in. And this particular scene, tell me what went on. And it was really fun to be able to share that information because to, that to me, I know people love pictures and autographs, but to me, that exchange is more valuable than anything because they get an insight into the world that they normally would just see on the screen. Now they get to look behind that curtain. And, and I love that interaction, having that personal interaction. So it was really, it was really kind of special. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't know if this is something that Jill told you about or not, but I, I attend a lot of shows myself. I've been to, you know, shows on the West coast, everywhere from like Chicago and, and Atlanta and, and here in Philly, oh, a wow. number of them here in Philly. And I actually moderate panels at these shows. So I'm oh, the great. one that's on stage with those guys. That's so awesome. At, and that's one of the reasons why I do it. Like you mentioned, the, the conversational aspect of it and getting to learn all those behind the scenes stuff. 
because as a big cinephile like I am, you know, loving movies and television, both what happens on screen and behind the camera, I, right. I love hearing all about that stuff. So, I mean, it's great getting the pictures with every. I'm not an autograph person. I mean, yeah, I neither have, am I. But yeah, I get it. You know, autographs can be bought, but pictures, you know, well, pictures can be faked, but it's not. Exactly. you're not going to um, you know <laughs> that would be sad yeah yes i mean all the photoshop pictures i have on my wall right now it's it's ridiculous <laughs> um i'm more about the moment being captured in the picture right. and then the memory of having the conversation and i mean and through that aspect of it i mean i've been on stage with people like carrie elwes from princess bride and right you know people in the big superhero movies and they're fun because the audience is into it and the audience is huge. But like, I mean, I've been on stage with people from like Kate Flannery from the office and, right. you know, voiceover actors like video game voiceover actors from red dead redemption. And to me, sometimes those panels turn out to be so much more fun than those big gigantic, panels. more interactive and more personal. No, exactly. I get that. Yeah. You know, I mean, not to go too much on a tangent here, but I just had this conversation with a good friend of mine, and I think we're living in a time now with social media and phones, you know, having cameras built in, good quality cameras, and capturing every moment and sharing every moment of our life that sometimes I think, and I know I'm guilty of this as well, so I'm not saying people do this, shame on you, I do it too, where we're so anxious sometimes to capture a moment that we miss out on experiencing yeah. the moment. And I know we, I just took my, my family to Hawaii for my wife's birthday and we were there and, you know, Hawaii is beautiful. What's not to, you know, want to take pictures of, right? It's magnificent. And the mountains and the ocean, it's beautiful. I'm taking pictures. I'm like, you know what? We're just sitting on the beach. I'm going to put the phone away. I just want to soak it in and take it in. And I think it's sort of like that. Well, we're, it's sort of tangential to what we're talking about as well, where if you have that time with, a, with somebody that you've seen on TV that you like, that you like the show they're on and you want to engage and talk to them about it, to me, that's so much more valuable and so much more interesting and fun than just getting you know, the autograph or the picture because you're having that, that interaction and you're actually you're experiencing the moment. You're kind of savoring that moment and not just like, I want to take a picture of it to make sure it's like, no, no, I want to have this experience that I remember, you know, but it's a little bit yeah. more than just the, the two dimensional experience. You know what I mean? So yeah. I think that's really important. I think that's probably why I enjoy doing that so much. I'm, I'm definitely guilty of that as well. I mean, I've done that more times than I can count, especially years ago, but I kind of, I kind of got to a moment in my life similar to you, you know, with your vacation in Hawaii, where I was like, I just want to enjoy this. Uh, and that moment for me was about two or three years ago, uh, 2019. I'm a massive Hugh Jackman fan. Oh, wow. He's so great. So what's not to like? Yeah. Yeah. So when he went on tour, I ended up getting tickets to his show when he came in Philly. And that was the moment where I was like, you know what? I'm such a fan of this man. This is a once in a, not once in a lifetime because he did a whole tour, but right, right. No, I get know, it. when is this going to happen again? So I made the decision. I was like, you know what? I'll take some pictures and some video for like the first five, 10 minutes. Right. And then after that, the phone goes in my Put it pocket away. Yep. and I'm just going to sit and I'm just going to enjoy this show for what it is. I think that's great. And I absolutely loved it so much so that when he ended up coming back in Philly, like six months later, I got tickets and I went again. And I didn't even take my, I think my phone got left in the car. Oh, wow. Because I just wanted to sit and watch the show. But that's, and, that's, and that's, really, that's, that's really fantastic. And I think the more that we can do that, not just, you know, obviously this is a bigger conversation than just, you know, getting to meet with a celebrity or someone, your favorite athlete, actor, musician, whatever. It's sort of... You know, I try to apply that to family as well in general, you know, just to make a make a point to sort of just enjoy the moments. And, you know, and as you get older and I'm definitely getting up there now, these are the things you think about. It's like, well, we don't know. We, it's not a given. Our time here is not given. We don't know how long any of us really has. So yeah. not to get too morbid, but you want to you want to enjoy it and you want to take it in and just soak in every second of it. So the more I have this away from my face and I can just sort of like, ah, oh, this is wonderful. I'm trying to do that a little bit more. Yeah. Well, I mean, at least it's you have this in front of your face and not this in front of your face. Yes, that's true. People that bring iPads to take. Oh, that's just not. Mm, yeah. And you're ruining yeah, the that, moment for everybody now, not yeah, just yourself. I think that's become <laughs> like I think that's become sort of like a cliche with like, you know, older tech folks, you know, people that are, you know, maybe over 50 or 60 that use technology like old people use. Uh, that's not true. I've seen other I've seen young people do it also. But yeah, the <laughs> iPad for pictures, it's not a good look. If you're out there taking pictures with your iPad, it's not a good look. But hey, you do you. Do your thing. But I'm just yeah. saying, you look like a giant TV head, but it's funny. It gives, <laughs> exactly. it gives us something to laugh about, right? So what yeah. the hell? Uh, so when you go to these shows and such, I, I mean, I think I know the answer to this question already, but who do 
people usually tend to recognize you? What projects do people usually tend to recognize you more from? I mean, you know what? Because voice, voiceover is one thing. You don't see a face. You just hear the voice. Correct. Yeah. And you, and you don't get that until you actually start the conversation with somebody. Right. Um, I would imagine it's probably Barry, but I mean, there's so many other projects you've done. It could be anything. You know what? The big two are always, like you said, my cousin Vinny and friends. And I think part of that is the project, forgetting about me being a part of them, the projects themselves have become so iconic and so timeless. You know, both of them have been around for decades and people are still enjoying them almost equally as much now yeah. as they did when they were, you know, first, you know, either released in the theater in, the, in terms of My Cousin Vinny or first on television for talking about Friends. So I think because those two projects have such legs, my association with them becomes stronger just because they're still relevant today. So it's usually, you know, you're the jerk from Friends, you're Barry, or you're my cousin Vinny, the two Utes, two Utes. So those are the things. But what I was amazed by, Ben, was when I was, um, when I was in Rhode Island, and, you know, because you have your, you know, for people that have never been to one of these conventions, you know, if you're not going specifically to see a specific person, and you're in the area where the celebrities or the actors or, you know, whoever are sitting around at their tables, they'll, they'll have a banner behind them that shows things that they've been in with their name and their face. Ah, it's me. And then on the table, there will be a selection of pictures to sign from different projects. If you're a fan of fill in the blank here, I'll have a picture for that that I can sign for you. Um, people immediately, my, uh, uh, TMNT, I was the voice of Donatello mm -hmm. in TMNT, in the movie TMNT. And that's another one of those iconic, you know, franchises to be a part of. I've, I've been lucky to be a part of several of them, right? So I think when people see that, you know, oh, that was you and that. So that's more of a visual of the picture, like you said, then they can't see my voice from this, but they see a picture of Donnie. They're like, that was you. I love that movie or I loved your version of Donatello. So I think Donatello got a lot more love than I ever imagined he would at this compared to Vinny and Friends. But then again, at, at these conventions, a lot of it is more pop culture in terms of the animation, uh, anime. So uh, yeah, Donatello got a lot more attention. And, and next awesome. time I said to my agent, I was like, we have to bring more Donatello stuff. People love Donatello. We <laughs> um, have to bring more pop finals to sign. So it's usually a lot of visual recognition, almost always friends and my cousin Vinny. But sometimes people surprise me and it's from uh god it's from um dogfight or best men or something else and i'm like really or, or zach and cody god help me i did an episode <laughs> of i only say god help me because like it's a ball of things to be recognized for i would think like it would be something else but i did like a i think was it a two-parter a very well-known episode of zach and cody where we were directing uh, i was i was the director of this high school musical parody um so it was a lot of people saw that and I did this song called Floss. I mean, it was crazy. So a lot of people remember that, which always freaks me out a little bit. But yeah, I think friends and my cousin Vinny are always the big two. Yeah. I mean, and, and I think one of the cool things about going to these shows and I'll ask you from, for, from your perspective about this as well. I mean, especially someone like you who like this is one of the first shows you've done in, in a while and Rhode right. Island Comic Con being the massive show that it is. I mean, I honestly think it is one of, I think in... Uh, you know, excluding San Diego Comic Con and New York Comic Con, I think it. Oh might no, be no, one. no! It's actually number two. I think in terms of people going, uh, yeah, I think I, it's past New I, York. I, I think, think it's now bigger it's San than New Diego, York. That's right. You know, Rhode yeah. Island and then New York, which is crazy, right? Do you, do you get to? I mean, do you have? Did you have your geek out moments? Like, if somebody get you, because as a celebrity guest, you get to go to a lot of places that the others don't. So you get to hang in the green room and you know where the the catering and everything is. Right. And you bump into all these different people who are also guests. Did you have any geek out moments yourself? You, you know what? Um, it's so funny because I got to spend a lot some time with Ralph, a, a lot of time with Ralph, Ralph Macchio, who I hadn't seen in a long time. We were and my cousin Vinny together. We've stayed in touch over the years. We haven't been able to see each other in person a lot over the years. So I got to hang out with him. And, you know, because he was not only promoting his book, you know, which New York Times bestseller author. Oh, I own friend. it. I, yeah, I know I'm getting I'm getting two. I'm getting the visual I'm getting the actual physical and the digital versions but yeah anyway yeah. so um you know he was there also with Cobra Kai and which is obviously a huge hit so mm -hmm. I got to meet Billy and I got to meet Elizabeth Chu from the original Karate Kid movie of course um so there were some people that I was very excited to meet and you know they were both really cool spent more time with Billy what a what a really wonderful nice guy great guy and then in the green room I got to see Zachary Levi and which is funny because I'm, so jealous. I'm I'm a huge fan of Chuck me too so you know I'm it's like one of my go-to like happy shows so it was fun to see him and now when we were out to dinner 
uh, with Billy and the gang. And, you know, Zachary sort of came over and started talking to him. So I got to meet him there. And it was just fun. So I've had, of course, you have those moments. Also, Vincent D'Onofrio, I saw and I talked to in the green room. Little known fact, Vincent D'Onofrio and I both did our first movie together. And it was a very... Um, Small trauma film. People that don't know a lot about trauma <laughs> oh, films, trauma, yep. they're not known for their classiest of productions. <laughs> nope. But we got, we both got our start doing a trauma film. And, he, and I said, you know, I hate to bring this movie. He goes, oh no. And he brought it. He's like, I don't mind talking, but we laughed. We were talking about doing that show together, filming in a summer camp, and what went on. And that's, I mean, it was great. So I hadn't talked to him in forty years. So I got to speak to Vincent D'Onofrio for the first time in four decades, and that was a lot of fun reminiscing about that movie. And so, yeah, I got to I got to geek out a little bit. I got to reconnect with old friends. So it was a, a good combination of you know sort of a hangout, a geek out. We'll call it a geek out. Well, yeah, it was a great geek out for me. Yeah, that's that's awesome. And it it really it it does my heart so happy to hear other Chuck fans because oh, I, I love that show. I am such a massive. Fan. It, it is probably to this day still one of like my top three favorite like um like hour long shows no oh, not I, sitcom but oh no no oh absolutely i have he i have my three that i always go to they're all single name shows it's fringe grim and chuck those are oh. my three guilty pleasure shows with fringe probably being number one just one of the greatest okay tv shows ever made well i just love fringe um but yeah it's uh it's great chuck is to me one of the great underrated hour shows that was ever done and i still I've watched it all the way through probably five or six times all the way through. And I still, I know all the lines. I still cry at the end every time, like a baby, not afraid to admit it. Uh, I still get emotional <laughs> watching that show last season, you know? So yeah, it was, so it was sort of surreal to see him. I was like, ah, there he is. And, and I'm get, a fellow actor, so I know better. I'm still like, there he is right there. So yeah. it was fun. And I get so excited every time. I know we're, again, this is another tangent. And apologies to listeners or people listening or watching. But <laughs> um, I get so excited every time I hear the rumbles that Zach wants to do a Chuck movie. Oh. You know, he wants to bring everybody back. Because I know that was the plan They're originally. all still friends, yeah. I think yeah. they're also pretty close. I would, I would absolutely love that. I would love it. Uh, I still laugh. Because, you know, the exterior for the Buy More was done not that far from where I live. That exterior okay. shot okay. was on Fallbrook. So whenever I'm over in that area, and I think, what was that? Was it a Kohl's? It wasn't a Kohl's. There was another store they, they used as the facade for Buy More. And then Underpants, et cetera, was right. And I start to laugh at Underpants, et cetera, which is a combination of many different stores. Yeah. And, I, and I know exactly where that was. And, I, and whenever we go to that strip mall, I'm like, ah. <laughs> underpants etc was right here so i get that's, i get that visual of whenever i go to that neighborhood it's so funny that, that's such a great show and you're right the uh, ending with like the with rivers uh, and roads playing in the background and kills me just it kills me I, and i know there were people that were disappointed with the ending but i was like you know like i i feel like that ending was fantastic oh it was the best and just i, I can't get into it because i'll start getting emotional and crazy <laughs> yeah love that love 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 me some chuck so yeah. you know what maybe in january or maybe in next year in 2023 i'll do a because i've done like top five episodes of community and i haven't done a top five episodes of friends episode yet or a top Ooh. five episodes of chuck but if i do a top five episodes of chuck maybe i'll bring you back you can be my guest for and we let's just do it over Chuck for like an hour. Oh, I would just, yeah, y'all, you had me a Chuck. I would yeah. do whatever you want. That's I love that show. <laughs> love it. Um, so off the topic of the convention, which I'm glad we got to talk sure. about, because I, I love talking about all that. Um, of course, we have to talk about friends, but I don't want to spend too much time on it because there's a bunch of other stuff I want to talk to you about. Right. Um, but of course, we have to talk about it because it's like you said. I'm it's here. Such, it, it, you're right. And it's such a massive hit. And one of the things that I, I, I really wanted to bring up and kind of addresses the fact that like you played, you know, Dr. Barry Farber, who was originally the fiance of Jennifer Aniston's character, Rachel. Right. And out of the 10 years that the show run ran, you were only in six, maybe seven episodes of the series. Correct. Correct. But that character resonated throughout all 10 seasons of that show i mean what was it like playing a character that even though you were only in a handful of it was still such a massive part of that series so much so that again everybody knows that character even though you were only in a handful of episodes i mean that that's like to, to me that's more of a testament to the show and how strong that show was and how people were attached to that show and how well written how well acted how well produced um, it, it was, it was incredible. It was like, it really was. I mean, I'm not over saying, saying a force of nature in terms of shows 
And um, it's, it's crazy. I mean, obviously, it's, it's been a big part of my career in history just because just having done it, I think people have asked me, well, how did it affect your career? And obviously, only positively. It's not that like I was on that many episodes or I got to show that much of myself. People are like, I want to hire that guy. But, you know, anytime you do something that has that kind of visibility, there is not a lot of downside. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was, it was amazing. And it was fun to be there from the beginning because I don't know if you heard the story, but I was originally down to like the final – cut the final two guys for, um, for Ross. Yeah. And at the last minute, they're like, Oh, we have this guy. We want to bring in David Schwimmer. We're going to, I was like, okay. And he ended up getting the part and rightfully so he was amazing. Um, but I never, I never felt, Oh man, that's horrible. It could have been me. I was happy to be a part of it. Cause I read the script and I, I thought it was going to be a huge hit just from reading the pilot script. And that's only happened to me a couple of times in my career when I read something that said, yeah, that's going to be a huge hit. But more than anything, I love the script. I want to be a part of it. And that's mm-hmm. what it was like for Friends. So even just being in those six or like you said, I think it was the sixth one was like a two-parter. So I guess seven, maybe. I don't know. Um, like the, the one that could have been, I think. Or, correct. was yeah. a two-parter. Yeah. Um, but it was, it was amazing. And I like having been on the entire journey from, you know, I think I started an episode two, if I'm not mistaken. Was I in the second episode ever of the show? I think so. I think so, yeah. Um, and just there was this sort of like under the surface excitement of everyone that was involved with it, knowing that it could be something really special. And then coming back over the years and seeing how that sort of grew and how it just kept on getting better and better. And because once, once you have those characters set, once you establish you have an amazing, you have amazing writing, amazing production, great actors, then you get to play. Mm-hmm. And the longer that a show like that goes on, when you have all those pieces in place, all those talented people in all different areas of the show, all it, all it does is get better because you get a rhythm going. You know each other really well. You can work off each other even better because you know each other so well. And you would think that that doesn't lead to spontaneity, but it really does because the, the chance for improv and knowing, knowing the rhythms, knowing the beats, knowing what you can do within the context of that script, really well-written scripts, um, the, the, the area for play is amazing. So... It was it was amazing. It, there's there's like I said, there was no downside to it. I loved my time, and people say, "Oh, if they ever did," an-, I was like, "Yes." <laughs> I, don't love it. I was like, "Why would I say no?" I think someone said, "If they did more, would you?" I was like, "Why would I not do more of something wonderful?" Well, that's um, what, and that was one of the things I was going to ask too, because you the, you know there was a, a a time there for a while where Barry was kind of out of the picture because right, right, Rachel right. had already moved on and was with Ross yeah. and whatever. And then, you know, in later seasons, they kind of brought you back. Like when Ross and Rachel went to your wedding and right. like, Barry's wedding and the crossover. So I would have to say like when the producers called and said, Hey Mitchell, would you like to? Yes. Of like, course. You know, <laughs> of course. And you know, I think there were some people that said, why weren't you part of the reunion? It's like, well, it wasn't really like more episodes of the show. That was more of like a round table discussion than it was more of friends. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And I'm sure I would hope that if they did do another season or if, they, if that was going to be more episodes of the show, uh, I would have loved to have had my character come back. People were like, did you feel this? I like, no, it was one thing and it should focus on them. It shouldn't focus on me. I know they brought some people back to talk about it, but if they ever did something more with it, oh yeah, I'd, I'd love to, I'd love yeah. to revisit that character with both of my hairs. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, and, and going back to one of the things that you said earlier about how, you know, when you have that cast and they, they put the work in and, you know, the longer they do it, the more cohesive it becomes and the, you know, there's more improv. I think a good example of that to anybody who's a friend of the, a fan of the show who watches the outtakes, because the outtakes of every season, which are one of like that show has some of the best outtakes of any series out there. Oh, they crack each other up. Yeah. And, and that's the outtakes are actually a very good indication of that. Cause if you look at the outtakes from seasons, maybe one through maybe three, you know, there are these light, Oh, oops, I made a mistake. Let's go back and do it again. Yeah. And, and then in the later seasons, it's outtakes it's like, of them intentionally doing exactly like, crack each other up. Oh yeah. They're totally breaking each other up. And it's great. Yeah. There's nothing, there's nothing I could tell you as an actor uh, the joy of making, you know, one of your castmates or fellow actors break. Um, and it, it can be hard to do because, you know, obviously, you know, you're, you're trained to sort of stay in the moment and go with, especially if you've had any background in improv or any sort of improvisational acting. Um, you, you know, you're sort of trained to go with it. Just go with it. Uh, but when you have those moments where you know you, you got someone, you got them, and you can just see the lips start to go and the eyes start to go, it's like, oh, yeah. Yeah. Let's finish this. Let's I'm, finish I'm, this. I'm finish digging him. in. I'm digging in further. <laughs> yeah. Fatality. Yes. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, it's pretty awesome. Exactly. I mean, so I mean, 
you know, even though you were in those handful of episodes, I know there are people that don't watch projects that they were a part of, but did you watch the series either when it aired or, or afterwards? I watched it when it aired. I haven't watched it as much in rerun. It's been, it's been on the air for 20 something years. Um, but yeah, I watched it when it aired and it was fun. I mean, it was, we, we, I think we had a couple of viewing parties for the first couple of episodes um, that I was in. And yeah, I watched, you know, it's hard. And I, I try to explain this to people. It's, it's not that I cringe watching myself, but again, it's when I, uh, let's, let's put it this way. When I go to a movie, when I go to a movie that I'm not a part of, I'm sitting in the theater. I'm sitting there like anybody else, just sitting there like a big fan, letting the movie wash over them. I'm not mm-hmm. sitting there picking it apart or saying, well, I would have, if they were, if I were shooting this, why they pick that? I just watch it and enjoy it. Um, I try to do the same when it's something that I'm in, but it becomes more challenging because it's easier when, you know, when you're not a part of something, just look at something and have it wash over you and enjoy it. When it's you, you know, you're wondering, okay, is that the best take that I did? Was that, oh yeah, I don't know. Because you realize as an actor, when you do all this work, when you're doing a movie or TV show, you're shooting multiple versions of that same scene over and over, even in television, even though they're shooting it in one night, you're still doing multiple takes of it. Um, so you never know which version the director and the editor are going to take to make that and to piece together that show. So you realize they can make a million different shows just out of the takes that they have. So sometimes when you're watching, you're like, oh, they did that. Okay, that was a really good choice. Oh yeah. So sometimes it's hard not to watch things clinically when it's you when it's you're watching yourself. Mm-hmm. I try not to do that. Or sometimes I'm just like, oh God, look at that. Oh, what it was, what was I thinking? I, so once you get past that, sometimes it takes a couple of times of watching something where you can just like, okay, I'm just gonna watch it and enjoy it. You know, and I'm not like that with the other actors. You only tend to do that with yourself. You know, it's your hardest on yourself than any part of yeah, yourself. Yeah, you're, you're kind else. of you're kind of your own worst critic. Um, of course. And I mean, and I'm kind of the same way, like with with podcasting. Like when I have conversations like this with, you know, with great guests like yourself, I oh, thank you, you know when I, you know, when the call is over and we're done, the recording's over, we've said goodbye and everything, you know, I sit there and I think to myself, I'm like, man, like that was such an amazing conversation. Like that was so good that when I'm editing, I hate listening back to the conversation that we had because then I'm like, oh, like, why did I say that? I could have phrased it like this. I I do the same thing. That question shouldn't have been asked that way. Like, oh, I I wish I would have asked this. And it kind of takes away from that euphoria I had when the conversation first ended. And, and you know, that's what I want to remember, not the criticism of myself. You know what? You watch it a couple of times. Uh, you watch it, as I like to say, clinically, the fir- or watch or listen the first couple of times. Once that's done, go back and watch it and then just sort of take it all in. That, that's, what, that's what I noticed what's happened with me, mm-hmm. especially, you know, it, it's so funny. I've, <laughs> the things that make me, I usually don't get nervous about interviews or meeting other actors or working with celebrities and stuff because it's, it's part of my day, day to day. It's part of my job, right? But still, as a fan, you can't help but, you know, get excited about certain people, certain things. Well, I'm a huge board game geek. Okay. I was going to bring this up because I found this out about you and it got me excited. I'm a huge board game <laughs> geek. And I've become friends over the last couple of years with Jamie Stegmeyer, who's one of the best game designers and publishers in the world. And he had me do a top 10 list on, on his YouTube channel, Mitch Whitfield's top 10 board games. Mm-hmm. And I, I felt pressure and nerd, and I was so <laughs> geeked out and excited about it. I was like, oh, I hope I don't, hope it, it's like when I first heard I was going to be Donatello. It's like, I hope I don't screw it up. Hope I don't mess it up. Hope people like the games that I picked. And I, I even said to him while we were doing it, I was like, I don't really get nervous, but I was a little stressed out coming up with this list. So yeah, it's, it's hard to not get geeked out or stressed out about the things that are important to you. So yeah, yeah. I don't even know why I brought that up. But I, no, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because that was something I wanted to bring up and I was going to bring it up at the end, but I might as well talk about it now. Hey, um, let's do I, it. I got into board gaming very oh, late I to you. the I got into it very late to the game. Maybe right. maybe like 5 or 6 years ago. Like board gaming to me before that was Monopoly, Monopoly and Life. Clue. Yeah, yeah uh-huh. stuff like that. And then I I I became friends with a group of people who like are my best friends now. Like actually this coming weekend, this Saturday, uh, PAX Unplugged, which is a huge tabletop board gaming convention in Philadelphia, is in Philly, and we're all going on Saturday because that's what we do every year. We get together and we go. And because of the pandemic, like we used to get together at least once a month, um, at the very least, if not more, to just right. gather around the table and break out as many games as we can. Oh, yeah. And, and then the pandemic hit, 
and we tried doing virtual games on Tabletop Simulator, and they worked. Some of them worked. Me some too. of them didn't. Yeah. This past Saturday, we got together for the first time, and like a gate, we did our thanks gaming day. I lo- what did you play? Um, so we played. So Splendor was one of the games that comes out okay. almost every time. Gotcha. Um, That's like Seven Wonders for us. But go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. We played another game. It's a game that I brought called Competition Kitchen, which is like a card game. It's kind of like Top Chef, but in card okay. game. Oh, that form. sounds really cool. And we had so much fun playing that. Um, we played Mysterium. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, there was, and there was a couple other games that hit the table that I can't remember what we played. I can't remember. One of them was really fun, and I can't remember the name of it. Um, and, you know, have you guys just, ever played Dice Throne, by the way? Glad you brought that up. <laughs> people, um, people on the video won't get this, but I, I did watch that video. Uh, my, there we go. I did yeah. watch that video of you doing your top 10. So I know that your number one is Dice Throne. It is. Have you seen the Marvel Dice Throne? Have I seen it in my closet when okay. my other games? <laughs> okay, yeah, I, I'm, I'm obsessed. Right. I have everything Dice Throne there actually is, including the Santa versus Krampus holiday There's pack. a Santa versus Krampus pack? Oh, yeah. And they even made metal <laughs> dice for it. I, the only thing I didn't get was the metal dice. And I actually, on Instagram, the people at Roxley Games who published the game, reached out to me like, oh, we're so happy you like the game. I'm like, the only, now I totally regret not getting the metal dice and they were laughing because they're so beautiful. Dice Throne is a great game to play virtually because as long as you have the character, your character and your opponent's character, you can play virtually. And I'll just, when you, put a, when you put an effect on me, I'll just take that chip and put it on my board. Um, it's a great oh. thing to do remotely. It's the perfect remote game. I so that's I think of that. I bought characters for my nephews. I bought char- my brother has it, so we can all play remotely on Zoom or you know however you know your platform of choice, Streamyard in this case. But I mean there are different <laughs> ways. So I love it because it does so well remotely, and it also, by the way, it plays really well at higher numbers, which a lot of people don't know. I've played a six-person version of the game, and it was amazing. Yeah, it's I, I agree with that. It's more fun the more players you have with Dice Throw. I agree. Yeah. Um, I mean, two players, it's kind of like, well, you have no choice but to attack the other players. Yeah, so. yeah, a little bit of get, take that, but, you know, that's the nature of the game. But the yeah. more, you know, and they, they really did a great job with the rules, but, uh, yeah, I feel bad like we're going on about board games, but, oh, dude, it's such, I mean. Oh, I no, I, 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 I intended to talk about this. Sitting on my desk right now, Burgle Brothers, I have this whole Stonemeyer shelf over here with all the Jamie's games. I mean, it's it's nuts. I, I, yeah. I could go on forever. I love but, it. But the group of friends that I have, like I said, it just felt so good to finally be sitting around a table again, right? Table again with everybody, and I mean, we had a conversation afterwards. We were like, you know what? We got to get back to doing this. Like once, at least once a month, we got to get back to board gaming, and because it's one of those things where, you know, like the the friend that I have, it's my friend Rob. So I'll give him a shout out. Like he's right. the one that always hosts, and it's him and his wife. They do. Um, uh, oh, I can't think of the name where everybody brings food dishes. Um, right. Uh, potluck. Potluck. Yeah. They, they do different themed potlucks and that's and what we like do that. at my friend Jack's house. And, well, but like they, when they do them, like they feel like, like the, the whole house has to be clean and everything and it gets kind of stressful. And we were like, let's just go back to board gaming because all the people that come over to game, we don't give a shit what your house looks like. <laughs> we just want to sit there and game. Just want to play. Make sure you so, clean your hands first though. Cause those, you know, yeah, just clear clean off yeah. the table, and we're good. Like, and we're good. Um, I feel. The but same yeah, way. I I got into it, and now I've built like a nice. You can't see it, but like I have a nice little collection. Like I have Dead of Winter so, and Rival. Well, let me look over there. Okay, yeah, yeah. Let me look. Oh, it looks good. I did the Brady <laughs> yeah. Bunch thing and look. Oh, it looks really good. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, but I mean, it, it it's it's so cool, like th- to know that you're you're a, board, a tabletop board gamer like that. It's just a ton of fun when I learned yeah. that. I love it. And, you know, I think it's the, the social aspect of it that I really enjoy the most. And even like even doing it remotely, you still have that connection on video, mm-hmm. you know, doing it remotely that way. But being around the table with friends and I don't even really care. And my metric for what I love in a game has definitely changed. I was even in, in my interview with Jamie. It's like I, winning to me, the, the sign of a great game is a, a game that you're enjoying so much. You don't even care if you win. And I'm talking about a competitive game. So as I got older, oh, why does it do that? You can still hear me, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, sorry, my whole setup here. Um, <laughs> as I've gotten older, when I was really young, I was super competitive. I played a lot of sports. I grew up playing hockey and refereeing hockey. And so those competitive juices are there. When it came to gaming, I realized it's like if you want to have fun at the table with your friends, 
that competitive edge has to sort of take a back seat to just the enjoyment of the socialization, just the social yeah. aspect of being at a table with friends, having fun. Yes, even a, in a co competitive game, just sort of make it friendly competition. And I'm going to wreck you. And that's why I think I stay away from a lot of take that games. For people that don't know, take that games are games where you can inhibit players from doing certain things, steal their cards or take a card from them. I prefer games where we're each doing our thing, you know, to enhance our own tableau or whatever we're doing rather than I'm going to punish you, Ben, for I'm going to play this card so your whole game is screwed. Because that to me, it takes away a little bit of that sort of fun. So I've definitely lost the competitive edge and I'm more into the friendly competition when it comes to it. So Yeah, and I'm, I'm kind of like the same way. Like when it comes to video games, I'm, if, if it's multiplayer games, like a fighting game or a sports game, I'm, that's where the competitive nature comes in. Like, yes. I want my team to win. I want to win yes. no matter what it takes. I'm the same way, yeah. You know, in, in video games. But you're right. When I'm sitting around a table, it's the aspect of like, I, I'm just having fun. Like if the game ends and I, I was the furthest away from winning, I it is what it is. I don't care. I had fun playing the game. What's the next game that's coming out? Like and exactly, that's, and that's I what feel we the love. same way. And we have like we we've all gotten into like backing games on Kickstarter and stuff like that. Ugh. And it got to a point where we we had to say like, okay, all of us own at least five or six games that are still in shrink wrap. They've never hit the table. because I wish I had only had game. five. Or, well, you know what? Right. I wish I had only five or six unplayed games. I probably have <laughs> closer to 50. Yeah, it, I believe it. It's bad. I, My wife is like, do you really need more? I was like, need more games. I don't think, honey, I don't think we're talking about need when it comes to board <laughs> games. It's not really a need. It's in that collector in me. Because board games have beautiful artwork. They have great yeah. writing, great table presence. So there's a collectible aspect of it for me as well, just because I love the beauty of them too. Some of them are just beautiful to look at. So I'll open up the box and go, oh, look at this miniature. Look at these cards. They're so. I'm really kind of a sad little man. But yeah, it gives me joy. <laughs> what can I do? It gives me joy. I can't help it. Yeah, so I'm 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 exactly the same way. But we kind of put ourselves on like a, a Kickstarter pause. We're like, okay, no more backing any games for a little bit, maybe a couple of years. And then when we go to PAX this weekend, we're literally like, I know at least my buddy Rob and I were like, okay, nothing over twenty dollars. We're bringing like a backpack or a shoulder bag. If it doesn't fit in the bag, we're not, it's not coming it. home. And you you let me know how that works out for you. I know. <laughs> That's what I, you know, Ben, about. I will follow up with you. I'll follow up with you in a couple of weeks. I want to hear how that worked out for you. Okay, yeah, we'll find out. Yeah, let's see how that works. I think we've tried that in the past and it never happens. Box it up and ship it. Yeah, oh, that, ha that has happened. <laughs> oh, I know it's happened. Of that course is, it's happened. It's happened to me too. Yeah, that has absolutely happened. I don't have room for this, but can you ship it? Yeah, we can ship it. All right. Of course we can. I'll take it. Here's my card. Um, Let's shift to. I'm glad. I'm so glad we got to talk about that because I did want. Oh, to you made me happy. Up. Yeah. Well, we could talk about this off the air too, so it's good. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, I want to talk about my cousin Vinny because that's an sure. that's another movie that I absolutely love. Um, and you know, I'm sure you've gotten it a lot, but you know, working with Ralph Macchio and Joe Pesci and Marissa Tomei, I mean, it's it's an amazing cast. When you and this was before Friends for you, yes. So when you took that role or at least read the script and then, you know, took the role, did you have any idea the movie was going to become such a fan favorite that it did? I mean, so much so that like it, it has an Oscar attached to it with Marissa Tomei. Absolutely. Um, I, I knew that I loved it. I knew I wanted to be a part of it. I knew it made me laugh and smile and I, everything, uh, Dale Lawner wrote the script. Jonathan Lynn directed it. And I knew just even on the page, just reading Dale Lawner's words, I was just, I loved it. And then, if, you know, of course, when I read the scene of me and Joe in the prison cell, thinking he's there to such a great make scene. me his <laughs> husband. Um, yeah, it was uh, it, just reading it on paper. I was, I loved every, every bit of it. And I really wanted to be a part of it. Did I know it would have the legs that it has and that it would be one of these movies that's, you know, evergreen? No, I did not. Um, but I was thrilled when it was. Uh, it still makes me happy because for a lot of people, like, you know, we talk about having our, um, our, you know, our happy, our happy place kind of shows, whether it's Chuck, we're watching a movie that we love that, you know, comfort food sort of for mm -hmm. visual comfort food. For a lot of people, my cousin Vinny is just that. That's what they go to, their go-to movie for family. They watch it every year. I've, I've talked to a lot of people, especially when I was in Rhode Island. They said, that's, that's my family's movie. We watch it all the time. And I heard that a lot. And it made me feel fantastic because in some small way, I was a part of something that 
gave people joy and continues to give people joy. And it's something, some, like I said, I say comfort food or, you know, uh, because it, in a way, you know, movies are a healthier version of that physically, I guess. But, um, yeah, I, I, I'm just, I'm blown away by what it's become and thrilled that it has. But when I first read that script, I knew I loved it and I thought it would be great. I didn't know 30 years later we would yeah. be talking about it and it was still not just around, but still really relevant to me. That's, that's sort of magical. So I had no clue, no clue. Yeah. And it's another one of those movies, you know, very similar to Friends that has, you know, a, a number of quotable lines that people still, I mean, you mentioned two Utes earlier in the conversation. Uh, one of mine, that's my, one of my go-tos from that movie is you were serious about that. Yeah, like, exactly. <laughs> you, you know, there are so many quotable, I it's another that movie that's too. just, it, it's so memorable in itself. And it's a movie that I don't think, I don't think I'll ever get tired of because no matter how many times I've seen it, it still makes me laugh. Isn't that crazy? And the one yeah. thing I bring up when people talk about, you know, the humor in the movie is, and think about it today, this is sort of unheard of. That movie was close to two hours and 20 minutes long. Is it really that That's long? That's a comedy that I think it's the runtime. I have to look it up. It's like two hours and 17 minutes, which okay. for a comedy is unheard of. Yeah. And Especially that, then. What, oh God. Yeah. But I mean, you know, now it's like, you know, they want, you know, movies are a business. You know, we, we love them. We, you know, we love going to them and seeing them. It's a business mm -hmm. and they want to get as many showings in the theater per day, especially these days where less people are actually going to the theaters. Um, so they want to make sure that they get enough showings. And the only way to get enough showings during the day to generate that daily income for the movie theaters so you make the movie is to have shorter. a, you have yeah. to have the movie slightly shorter. So I guess what is the sweet spot? Like an hour and 40 minutes or less. Um, but this was a movie that was almost two hours and 20 minutes and a comedy. So it's really a testament to not only the script, but also to our director, Jonathan, and how he paced that movie. Because the pacing becomes sort of the driving force for how a movie feels. Mm -hmm. And I've used this analogy before in interviews where you can sit in a movie and it could be an hour and 20 minutes long and it feels like it dragged on forever. Yeah. Or, you know, conversely, you can sit in a movie for three hours and go, what do you mean it's over? I, I just started. So that's not necessarily, you know, indicative of the length of the movie. That's how well the movie is paced. So I think My Cousin Vinny is a very well-written and very well-paced movie. And that made the length of it sort of inconsequential because people don't even realize when I mention it, like you, they're like, it's really I had no idea. I was like, it was long. You know, I'm going to look it up while we're talking. Yeah, that, I mean, and, and that's, that's fine. But I mean, you're right. I mean, the length of a movie definitely dictates, can, can dictate the enjoyment of the movie as well. Absolutely. I, you know, I go, I go to a lot of advanced movie screenings, and one of the first things I look for once I'm sitting in the theater is I usually get on my phone and I look at the running time of the movie I'm about to watch. Yeah, of if course. I'm, if, if I'm sitting in the theater going to see a Marvel movie, like, a, like when I saw Wakanda Forever, and I go online and I see it's two and a half hours, I'm like, okay, that makes sense. That's pretty par for the course, two hours, you know, two. 15 to 30 is that last night I went to a screening of violent night with David Harbour. I want to see that. How was it's it? It's so much fun. I knew it was going to be. It is so much. Like I, I actually took my mother with me to the screening cause she wanted to see it and I could hear her audibly laughing and gasping next to me. And I could hear people like the entire theater was. Just oh, it looks like so I love the idea of it. You know, badass Santa. I mean, yeah. who doesn't want to see that? And, and, one of the things, you know, when you usually see like action, like over the top action movies like that, you know, that are holiday themed, in my mind, I think hour and 35, hour and 40. And then I sat in the theater and I looked up the running time like I usually do when I saw hour and 55. And it kind of surprised me. I was like, oh, I didn't expect it to be that long. Right. And it doesn't feel that long. See? At all. Because it's so enjoyed. Like you are yep. enjoying the movie. Yep. And when you're yeah. having fun, I see, I have to see that. I, I have to see Wakanda forever. And I have to see, uh, the sand, what was it called again? Violent night, violent night. I, I this, it's one of those things where I saw the trailer for it. And I was like, Oh, I have to see that movie. I was, I, have I to saw, see that movie. I saw the movie poster of David Harbour as Santa. I was like, wait, David Harbour is playing Santa. Like with the, with okay. the hammer, they have like a hammer over his shoulder. Now, well, this was before he even had the hammer. It was just okay. him as Santa. Right. I was like, okay, this interests me. And I saw, and then the, when I first saw the trailer, I got to the end of that trailer. I was like, this might be my new favorite Christmas movie. And I haven't even seen the movie yet. Exactly. Yeah. That's going to be in the holiday favorite now too. Right. Yeah. Oh yeah. That and spirited are going to be two of my new favorites. Every oh, God. Year. Oh, God. Um, no, it's, it, yeah, but it's, it, it's, now, how, when you go to the movies, are the theaters crowded still? 
Or have they, have they become crowded again? Or is it still sort of mm, I half- have been. I haven't been going to anything outside of screenings. Okay. But the screenings are pretty full. Wakanda Forever. The screenings was, are packed, yeah. Yeah, Wakanda Forever was full. Violent Night last night was pretty full. Um, I haven't really been to a movie like on my own, I, like going okay. and buying a ticket and going. Uh, there are a couple movies I do want to see that I miss the screenings of. Like I missed the screening of The Whale, which is Brendan Fraser's new movie. Right, right, right. It's supposed um, to be great, by the way. I, He's supposed to I be he- amazing in it. I hear the movie is great, but it's very heavy. Yes. Um, no pun intended on the character. No, I know. I know. It's, um, it's, yeah, it's, it's, not, a, it's not a rom-com. Yes, no, absolutely. Not at all. But that is one that I will most likely go to theaters to see. Right. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I can't speak for regular movie screening or regular movie showings on how busy they are. But screenings have been busy. But that could also be there people getting free tickets to go see movies. Yeah, so I think the not? screenings are a little bit different. But, uh yeah, I just, I, I would love to see, you know, the industry sort of get back to it. And I get it. I get it. We've gotten used to, I mean, you know, the pandemic has changed a lot of things. Some things I think for the better, uh, aside from all the negative, obviously all the death and horrible things and mm-hmm. loss of money. But there are some things in terms of how we live our day-to-day lives and how we work now uh, that I think have changed slightly for the better. But one thing I'd like to see come back is the movie industry because it's so, it's easy to watch movies at home and it's sometimes it's convenient. I've had a bunch of surgeries over the last several years. So there are certain movies I couldn't have gone to. So having the option to watch them at home when they came out, huge, huge yeah. thing. But still being in the theater is such a wonderful thing. And I'm just hoping that, you know, I'm hoping that doesn't go away because, you know, obviously the theaters aren't doing as well as they used to. So if we could all be safe and find our way to still support that, that would be fantastic. Yeah. I mean, I'm a big theater goer. At least I was, you know, before the pandemic. Like yeah, I, me too. I, I had and still have like an AMC uh, Stubbs Gold membership. So, you know, I can go see as many movies as I want. And get the month. popcorn and drink refill. So yep. let's not put that, you know, come it, on. Ex- exactly. But yeah. I haven't been utilizing it since theaters reopened. Um, but I but I refuse to cancel the subscription because I know eventually I want to get back to going right. to see movies a lot. Right. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm right there with you. Like I I love the movie going experience, the theater going experience, whether it's you know a, a movie in the theater or going to New York to see a Broadway show. Oh, I mean, God, I, yeah. I made it a point. I went up to see Music Man because again, Hugh Jackman. Um, I went up to New York to see Music Man, and how was uh, it? It was fantastic. I mean, it That's was awesome. it was Hugh Jackman <laughs> in Music Man, like it can't on Broadway. And, and yeah. now I'm excited because we keep going off on all these different tangents, but I don't care. That's okay. Um, that's what that's these. The fun uh, of it. That's yeah. That's the fun of these conversations. I'm now excited because once Music Man is off Broadway in January, they're clearing Winter Garden, and the musical that's taking over is Back to the Future. Oh wow. Yeah, which has been playing wow. in the West. It's been playing in the West End in London, and has actually won a bunch of awards in oh London. God. And I've been like, I, I was telling people for years, that for like the past two or three years, I'm like, if you want to get me a gift, a plane ticket to London is nice, so I can go see Back to the Future. That doesn't suck, you know. Yeah. It's, I'm I'm very intrigued by what they're making, you know, what they're making into Broadway shows now, and how that you know, because a lot of it, obviously, being out here. In LA, you know, some of the stuff will make it, you know, to the Pantages here, beautiful theater. There's some great shows that make it here, obviously, and touring companies or st- shows that start here and go to Broadway or, and vice versa. But obviously nothing like you see on Broadway mm-hmm. or in London for that matter. And I'm always there. <laughs> I did a movie years ago called Dogfight. Pretty dark film. Was there like a dark love story with River Phoenix, Lily Taylor, myself, Richard Ponabianco, and Anthony Clark, and uh, E.G. Daly. Um, and it was a really interesting, dark film about these Marines uh, the night before they go off to what is to become Vietnam. And they're one last shebang before they go off. And the theme of it was kind of dark. And I think that's why it didn't get uh, fully embraced, which I understand. But they ended up making a musical out of it. Hmm. Dogfight the musical. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. That was something I would never think they'd make a musical out of. Yeah. It's right up there with Anne Frank the musical, which <laughs> I Wait, couldn't is there believe. An, is there really an Anne Frank the musical? There was off-Broadway, absolutely, Anne Frank oh. the musical. Okay. Oh, yeah. Certain things, and it's sort of like, you know, brought back memories of, I was like, is that real? Because I couldn't help but think of the Mel Brooks movie, The Producers, or the, the Broadway show, The Producers. Which I love they, the Broadway show of The Producers. Oh, please. It's fantastic. Yeah. And where they famously, you know, where they're making, for people that don't know, 
they, 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 the whole idea is these two crooked producers are trying to get everyone to invest 100%. You know, you, you want 100%, you want 100%, and the only way they can do that is by making sure they create a flop musical so they don't have to pay anybody back. They get all the investment money, the show tanks, and they get to keep it. They don't have to share the percentage. Mm -hmm. And, of course, they decide to make springtime for Hitler, which is a and great it, thing. For, so, of course, when I, when I heard Anne Frank the musical, I was like, is this a joke? Um, I don't know if it's a very tasteful joke, but, uh, yeah, you know, Anne Frank the musical. Absolutely. I actually know someone that was in it. So I'm always intrigued by what makes that conversion from either television property, movie property, or book um, to 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 the stage. So and now now I'm kind of back to the future. Sounds really interesting. I kind of want well, to see it now. And and I'm like I'm all my friends know like I am. Anytime they have questions about Back to the Future or they learn interesting tidbits about Back to the Future, like I'm the go-to person. Like I. In my living room, I have like a whole shelf that's nothing oh. but like I have like the Crystal Pepsi and the license plate and the newspaper. Like, oh I have, my god, I'm a massive Back to the Back to the Future fan. I've met Bob Gale, Michael J. Fox, Christopher Lloyd, and like oh I've, I've met the cast. Um, so when I first heard Back to the Future the musical, I was like, man, like really, like did you have to make a musical of it? And, and now you're intrigued. And then I, I heard all the awards and the accolades, and then they put the soundtrack on Spotify, and I was like, okay, I have to listen to the soundtrack. And the soundtrack is fantastic. Is it really? It's really good. Oh, my God. Now I have to go listen to it. And so by the way, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Just no, and, I was, that, and no. I was just going to say, so now when the show hits New York in June, I will be going well, to be see there. Back to the Future. Yeah. Oh, hell yeah. I was going to say, all I could think of when I when I think of Back to the Future, the one line that always comes to mind is you better get used to those bars, kid. <laughs> that just it always was is that his Uncle Joey, was Uncle it? Joey. Uncle, Uncle Joey. Uncle Joey, yeah. Uncle Joey. So that's Bird the one Joey. thing that always <laughs> it always yep. stands out in my mind when he sees him there in the crib. You better get used to those bars, kid. And I just laugh. I just it was a great reference. I just there, love that. There are so many little nuances to that trilogy that I love that so many people don't know about. And I love any time I get to be around somebody when they discover those little things. Like, I'll, I'll just give you, like, one example. Yeah. Um, the T-shirt that Doc Brown is wearing in 1955 when he's in the DeLorean and it gets struck by lightning and he gets sent back to 1885. Right. In Back to the Future 3, because it took me a while to discover this one, in Back to the Future 3, when Doc and Marty are hijacking the train and Doc is wearing a bandana, it's right. the faded shirt he was wearing in the DeLorean. Really? And it's got trains on it. Oh, that's awesome. It's a 50s shirt with like little pictures of trains on it. And when it's hard to distinguish because the shirt is very faded when he's wearing it as a bandana. But if you look close enough at it, it's faded trains. It's the shirt he was wearing in the DeLorean when it's struck by lightning, which makes sense because it was on him. It was probably one of the only pieces of clothing he had. Right. Oh my God. That, yeah. Don't you mean to, okay. So now I'm going to blow your mind a little bit unless you're, are, are you a big fringe fan or no? I, I did watch the series and I was a big fan of it, but I didn't dive very deep okay. into it, but I do know of the show. I did watch it. Then you'll probably get this reference. If it, by the way, if someone is planning on watching Fringe, I come spoiler alert. Hardly, right? I was going to do a spoiler alert now, and then when I'm done, you can unmute. I'm going to put my hand up as soon as I'm done. So <laughs> if you want to watch Fringe and you don't want to know any spoilers, please stop listening right now. Okay. So in Fringe, you know they have the alternate universe, which is kind of mm -hmm. just like our universe but slightly different. When they go to the other crossover and go to the other universe in one of the episodes, on one of the marquees. Uh, you'll see, I think there was like, it said Back to the Future starring Eric Stoltz. I love okay? it. <laughs> okay. So uh -huh. for a lot of people that don't know, and by the way, uh, okay, I'm going to put my hand up around because spoilers done. <laughs> um, but for a lot of people that don't know, Eric Stoltz was the original actor that not chosen. He did the first two weeks of shooting. Yeah. And then they stopped and then he was replaced by Michael J. Fox. Where Eric Stoltz is a brilliant actor and has gone on to have a great career. But um yeah, <laughs> Back to the Future starring Eric Stoltz. I thought that was genius. Genius. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, that, that's, I thought yeah. you'd appreciate that. So, yeah. That's a lot of fun. And I, I probably did see that when I was watching. And then but it goes by really fast. But yeah. Yeah, but I just didn't think of it. And that was one yeah. of the things, too, uh, when I had that, like meeting Michael and meeting Chris, you know, Chris Lloyd were, were all fantastic. And I was, of course, I geeked out, especially because the picture with Christopher Lloyd I have is standing in front of the DeLorean. Oh, my God. So I was like, OK, that's like, Dude, I had that's... to do that. Yeah. But honestly, I think I geeked out a little bit harder when I met Bob Gale, who's the creator of Back to the Future. Right. And I actually got to interview him for the podcast, but it was an in-person interview. See, that's 
friggin' amazing. Yeah, and I'd like to have him back on because unfortunately that audio was not that good. It was back when I was first podcasting, so the right. audio wasn't great. Um, I still have it. I could probably still try and clean it up as best as possible. But uh, Man, that'd be great to do it again, though, and just have like a, I, a I'd just love to ha- take on it. Yeah, I'd like to have it do it like this, like where there's actual oh, video absolutely. we're having face to face. But I mean, one absolutely. of the things that like has been reiterated, and he even told me then when I asked him, I was like, "Is there ever a chance of a remake?" And he's like, "Over my dead body," and he really? and he's like, he's like literally over my dead body. I own the rights to Back to the Future. He's like me and Robert Zemeckis own the rights to that movie. Nobody will can never do happen. a remake without our permission, and it will never happen. You know what? I kind of love that. I do and too. I, I don't. I don't love that because you know I don't want people to feel like I'm you know endorsing the uh, holding back a property that people love. But there's something to be said for, you know, you don't you don't mess with perfection, mm-hmm. and it's you know it's been it's been heralded as one of the more perfect movies. It's kind of a perfect movie. Yeah. I'm not. I'm not. I'm talking about the trilogy in general. The but first one. Not just for the sake of this. I'm talking about the original film. Yeah. Just Back to the Future. I mean, and sometimes it's nice to leave things well well enough alone. And I will tell you. Um, and again, I know you know this, but for your, for your fans and people that watch and listen, you know, Hollywood is a very tough place and it's very, the entertainment industry is very cutthroat, very difficult. There's a lot of money at stake, a lot of money that's made, but also a lot of money that's at risk when you invest in a project and it doesn't turn out the way that you want it, or you put all this money into a film. It doesn't have a great opening weekend, which means it doesn't have great follow-up weeks, which means you have to make the money back in DVD sales or in, you know, streaming. So it's, it's a business like anything else at the end of the day, it's a business. So when a movie doesn't do what you want it to do, well, what, you know, you don't really have a, it can become very difficult. So what do you do? Producers, writers, studios, television studios, movie studios, let's take something that's less risky. What's less risky? Taking an existing property and either iterating or reiterating, okay? So let's remake this. Let's revisit this by having another season of a popular show. Let's bring back Will and Grace, which Will and Grace is one of the great shows ever. So I'm not begrudging them for bringing that back, but I'm just saying it's good business to want to bring back things that you know are successful because you know there's a built-in audience that will pay either to have it on television again or to have in the theaters again or to stream it. You know, it's a new, the new thing, right? So not a new thing, but it's a new metric to go by. So I don't begrudge people for wanting to remake stuff because it's a smart business move. But from a fan's perspective, there are certain things I'd like to see left alone. So yes. when I hear this, that the creators care as much as I do about certain properties, care enough to say, you know what? We're happy. We're, we're going to stand. We're happy with, with the hand that we have right now. We're not yeah. going to push it. And, and, and it, I kind of, I respect that a lot. I do too. And I'm, I'm, when I heard Bob say that and I've heard, uh, you know, I've heard it repeated a number of times since then that there will never be a remake. Like I kind of feel at ease a little bit knowing that, you know, right. Because I know, like, people have asked Christopher Lloyd, like, oh, would you do it if they brought it back, if they made another one? And they all have their own opinions on it. But just knowing that they stand firm, that there will never be another movie, there will never be a remake, I'm like, I'm good. Like, I'm perfectly happy with that. Yeah, I feel the same way. I'm um, going to burp now. <laughs> I'll just talk because, over it. Right. Because I'm a classy dude, and I <laughs> did announce it, turn my head, because I'm a classy fella. That's right. Mm-hmm. Thank um, you. Yeah, and, and and I'll just leave you with this one more Back to the Future fact, and then we'll go for on. it. Um, one of the fun things I enjoyed seeing too is if if anybody has ever seen. Now I, I'll ask you this because um, do you know what the original idea for the time machine was before it was a DeLorean? Well, I can't say phone booth because that was Bill and Ted. No, but um, it. Mm, but you're, that's that's oh, the first thing that that's the first thing that came to mind for some reason. But I know that's also Bill and Ted. So go ahead, tell me what it was. It was a refrigerator. Really? Yes, it was a refrigerator. The idea was that it was going to be Marty was going to be in a refrigerator. Now, when I explain this, you might realize you've seen this before because it was reused. The original idea that the time machine was going to be Marty was in a refrigerator that was part of a nuclear explosion. What? And it, and it was the nuclear explosion that sent the refrigerator back in time. 
that had that I, I like the DeLorean better. Oh, I love the DeLorean better. What are you kidding? But Spielberg has reused that idea. If anybody remembers the opening of Indiana Jones and the Crystal Skull, when Indy is on, I think it's out in Nevada when he's in that test area where they're setting off the nuclear bomb and he knows he can't get out of the area. Oh, doesn't he put himself in a refrigerator? He puts himself himself in a refrigerator. And the refrigerator is blown out of the area and he survives miraculously. Right. How does that happen? It's almost as if it was written that way. Oh, that's crazy. I didn't realize that is awesome. They changed the idea, one, because it was horrible. Um, And two, because the writers and the producers had a fear that after seeing the movie, Kids, kids would go into refrigerators going, and it would be dangerous. Yeah, they were, I got it was it. going to become dangerous that kids yep. were going to start going into refrigerators, pretending it's time machines. They were going to get locked in and there was going to be too many accidents. But now those same kids are speeding in a very unsafe, albeit very popular, DeLorean. <laughs> yes. We got yes, what is it, 86 point, or 88. What was it? 88 point, yeah. 88 miles an hour. Yeah, yeah. And, but it is... To the nth degree, a lot harder to get your hands on a DeLorean than it is a refrigerator. That's true. And so, you do have to have the driver's license and all that. So, yeah, you're right. It's safer. Yes. It's, it's a little safer. And a refrigerator, safer. that would not have been the same movie. No, it wouldn't have. I'm glad well, they, they went with the head made it work in a phone booth. So, I mean, hey, we can't be too harsh. Yeah. But, you know. Exactly. Um, another movie I want to bring up that you yes. were in. Um is a movie, so, you know, we talked about, like, being in the pandemic and going to, like, you know, people re-watching Friends and things like that. There's comfort shows and comfort movies. Yep. Even pre-pandemic, there are a handful of movies that I will just regularly go back and rewatch because I just adore them. Right. Um, you are in one of those movies, and it's not My Cousin mm-hmm. Vinny. Uh, two of the movies in that handful of movies are military movies. One of them is Down Periscope, which you are not in. With Sergeant Kelsey Bilko? Sergeant Bilko. Oh, wow. <laughs> that is so funny. That you know, you know direct, the, it was the same director as my cousin Vinny. Oh, that I did not know. Jonathan Lynn directed. That's how I got the movie. He's like, okay. do you want to do, you want to do, I was like, work with you again? Uh, yeah, it's sort of like the Friends thing. Where, in what scenario or what scenario would I say, uh, no, I think we're done. Of yeah. course I wanted to do it. I didn't have a ton to do in that movie. But um, but it was still fun to that movie. It was a blast. Well, I mean, again, like uh, similar to my cousin Vinny. I mean, look at the yeah. cast of Sergeant Bilko. You had Steve yeah, Martin, cool. Dan Aykroyd, the late Phil Hartman, um, you know, Chris Rock in his very early in his career. Uh, yeah. Glenn Headley, who um, recently passed as well. I mean, it, yeah. it, it was a fantastic cast. And it really that was. movie, it's not critically rated. I, I think it's very underrated because that movie – still makes me laugh. Uh, I, I love that movie. Yeah, it was it was a lot of fun. It was fun to be a part of it. It was fun to, you know, I enjoyed the movie as well. But, I, you know, it's funny. You bring up movies and immediately I start thinking about when we made it, what we were doing and different mm-hmm. scenes. That, so as soon as I hear it, I can't help but like go back to that time. And I still remember getting to hang out with Steve Martin and boy, talk about a genius. Yeah. Actor, uh, film writer, uh, playwright, author successful at all of them um and just such a brilliant guy and people would probably be very surprised to know he's very shy and understated in person yeah that's very kind of very much so you would think you know especially if you go back to this you know snl stuff um where you know the wild and crazy guys and all the characters he's played and he's such a gifted physical comedian as well and just a wonderful actor and you don't think of him as being you know subdued and you know sort of shy and a little withdrawn uh, in public, but he's just very, very, you know, very shy and quiet and just, just a friggin' genius. Friggin', it was so much fun working with him, watching his approach and just getting to spend time and just pick his brain a little bit and work. It was wonderful, wonderful. And, and Phil Hartman and I became friends and uh, obviously that, you know, tragedy, awful. Yeah. Um, but what a, another, just another great guy, funny and caring, just a, just a really good guy. It's so interesting to hear you say that about Steve Martin because that was something I didn't I didn't know and I didn't assume yeah. just because of the personality that he shows, and you know it's something we've ta- I've talked about with friends of mine too is that there's a 
everyday like yourself brain and then for some people there's that performer's brain right. and they're kind of two separate entities that exist within the same person like i mean i'm i'm a very um I, I, I'm the same way. Like I like quiet. I'm not a big party or I don't go to bars or things like that. Me neither. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm very, um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? <laughs> I don't know why that, that homebody. That, well, I am, I am a homebody and such, but like, I, I like things very quiet and subdued. Right. But, but at the same time, that's when it's, when people know that about me and they learn that about me, they're also surprised to learn that I love going to conventions right. and being on stage in front of crowds of hundreds to thousands of people. But they're that's like, different. Well, that's a different part of you. You know, they're both you. They're just different parts of you. That's the performance brain. Correct. Exactly. You know, that's like, oh, that's a completely different part of me. And um, introvert. That's the word I was looking introvert. for. Introvert. Introvert. I'm, but you know, I'm very introverted, but that part of me is very extroverted and loves doing it. And I'm like, well, first off, it's a performance. So I, it's a mindset that I have to get into to do it. Even though I'm still me, I'm not doing anything differently outside of my own personality. It's still a performance in a way. Right. And at the same time, I'm not in the crowd. So the introvert part of me is not freaking out because I'm around Correct. all these people. Right. I'm with all these people, but I'm kind of in my own area. No, I, I, I totally yeah. get that. And I get the dichotomy also. I really do. And I think there's this perception, I think, that actors are always on or they need to be the center of attention. And obviously you see them on screen, whether it be little screen or big screen, you're like, oh, they must crave that. I mean, maybe some of them do. It's just like some people, just people. Some people do crave that, whether they're, they make their living doing it or not. But for the most part, it's just like, it's, just, it's that work side, that other performance side is a different part of you. I don't need, I don't like standing up and talk. I mean, I can stand up and talk to a thousand people, not a problem. I can do it. Mm -hmm. In my personal life, would I want to do that? No. If I have a professional thing or I'm doing it from doing, you know, speaking engagement, whatever, of course it's fun and I'm comfortable doing it, but do I need to be in front of a crowd when I'm, you know, on my off time or do I need to be the center of attention? No, no. Yeah. You know, I like joking around with friends and family and having conversations, but I'm also sitting around and watching a game or just playing a board game. I don't need to be that, oh, I am the center of the world. And I think a lot of actors are like that. And I think it's probably more surprising when it's someone like Steve Martin like I said, is so gifted at the physical comedy, people assume, oh, that's him. That's just who he is. Mm -hmm. And it's not. You know, you never know. Again, that, that, that's, a, that's a compartmentalized part of what we do. Um, again, I, not everyone is like that, I'm sure. But yeah, and I, I, I think I was surprised. And it was really nice. It was really nice to get to know him on that level. And uh, I think when you work with people that you've already, uh, that you're already a fan of or that you already enjoy, you know, there's that little bit of, oh, what's it going to be like? What's it going to be like working with that person? Then you really, as an actor, and you should know this, it's like shame on us, you know, for not knowing because we are actors as well. It's like, it's a person doing their thing. And then when they're off camera doing their, just a regular person you're hanging out and having a chat with. And that's, yeah. that's the way I like to think I am. So why would I be surprised that someone that I've idolized in movies that's bigger than life would not, you know, would, would be anything other than that as well. So yeah, it was, it was great to, it was a great fun film roundabout way of getting back to this but yeah and getting to know steve was pretty incredible too and i yeah i can imagine and yeah so i mean just know that like i just again it's not a highly rated film it's but i i love that film it's i, I love mean, that that's awesome it, it's such a great movie i mean there there are scenes in that movie that does it just similar to my cousin finney or friends or whatever i mean there's scenes that doesn't matter how many times i see them i still chuckle every time i see them <laughs> i mean i have to go back and watch it now it's been forever since i've seen it I mean, there's a, there's a scene in that movie where Steve Martin is late for the wedding, like he missed he missed the wedding, and he's walk he's coming up in the walker, and he knows he's going to get slapped, and she like draws back, he takes his glasses off, she slaps him, and then he just puts his puts him back, back on, on, yeah, like and it's such a quick motion. It's I'm like, like, yo, just do what you need to do. I don't have time for this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that that scene still makes me laugh like every every single time. So that That's just awesome. know that there's a movie that you are in that is one of my probably like top ten comfort. I jokes. love that. And it was not one that I would have thought of. So there you go. Yeah, there you go. Um, I know we're, we're, we're a little over an hour. Actually, we're, we're hitting about the hour range. So we'll, we'll get ready to wrap some things up. But um, 
you know, more lately in your career, you've been focusing more on, you know, voiceover. You know, you mentioned yes. TMNT and Transformers. Um, and I know there's a number of other projects that you've worked on. Did the, did the transition to going from on camera to behind the mic, did that kind of happen naturally? Or was that something more you kind of just wanted to focus towards? I think that's a great question. That, I think it's a combination of the two. Um, as an actor, uh, you know, we all have egos as human beings. Hopefully you don't let your ego get in the way of things because I think your ego it, its a double-edged sword, very much so, because your ego also brings us the confidence to try things that we wouldn't necessarily try before mm -hmm. or feel com more comfortable doing that, but it can also get in the way. Um, as an actor, you try not to let your ego get in the way. Uh, and what I mean by that is the nature of the business has changed, like any business. Um, and I felt there was a big transition where I was, I started, competition is part of it. We talked about competition in gaming, right? And I don't like it. You know, I just like the friendly competition. In the film and television industry, very much a big part of it. And to an extent, you're always competing for roles. Um, and I don't mind. That's part of the thing. You audition, you go back, you meet the producers, hopefully they pick you. And that, that, doesn't, that doesn't change. Even when you become a huge star, you have a lot of huge stars still auditioning for stuff that people wouldn't necessarily think of them as being in, but they want to audition to be a part of it. Um, I found myself competing and auditioning for roles that I would never think I would have to compete and audition for. Uh, I, I never was one of those actors that thought, ah, oh, you owe me this and uh, you have to give me the lead in that thing or you should give me a recurring role in your hit show without even looking, you know, auditioning before. It wasn't like that. Mm -hmm. But auditioning for stuff, smaller stuff that in the past I never had to audition for before. Because um, you know, people knew me from different shows or different TV series that I was on. I had my own series a couple of times, a lot of different movies. So they'd say, hey, would you do this part and this thing? Of course, of course, that'd be great. Let's do it. But now those same things that normally would be a no-brainer, a small role in this, like, well, would you come audition for it? I'm like, ooh, and it started feeling a little strange. Like I almost felt like I, the industry had taken or things started moving backwards. Where now I was competing for things that I would never have to compete for before as much. And it felt kind of like, ooh. And again, that doesn't mean that I didn't, wouldn't audition. How dare you make me audition? It wasn't that. Mm -hmm. It was a type of roles that were coming around that people would normally feel very comfortable saying, here, we'd like you to do this part. And I'd say, that'd be great. Thank you for having me. I'd love to do it. And they're like, yeah, we want you to come audition for these three lines on this thing. I'm like, oh, I didn't really want to do that. And it started feeling a little icky, for lack of a better term. The voice world started picking up simultaneously. So it was sort of like it was the perfect thing happening at the perfect time. Um, I'd always done voiceover. I'd done voiceover work for about the last 45 years. So maybe 46 years. I guess it started when I was 12. That makes me 58. I'm good at oh, math. Oh, wow. Uh, I didn't realize it was that far back. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I started like, yeah, at least like 46 years ago. And then animation started for me probably mm, maybe 20 something years ago. Uh, getting because that's you know that takes a little bit longer to break into than just traditional voiceover work mm -hmm. and that's more out voiceover was big in New York animation more out here so once I started breaking into that it sort of coincided with me not auditioning quite as much because I didn't feel as comfortable um, so it was sort of the perfect storm so that started picking up now to, to take it to the next level would I go back on camera TV and film absolutely absolutely that was going to be a question um, I was going to ask. Yeah, well. yeah, yeah. If the right thing came along, I absolutely would. The only thing that's changed is like my day-to-day -day isn't me auditioning for film and TV anymore. Mm -hmm. Would I still do it? Uh, absolutely. And if the right project came along, would I audition for it? Of course. But just my daily routine of like going out, running around, audition for this show, audition for this show, it isn't like that anymore. But I, of course I would still do it. Of course I would still audition for something. Um, I still have people that I've worked with that ask me, well, would you audition? Like, of course I would. I'd love to work with you or audition. So yes, it's still out there. But I think my day-to-day -day of going out there and you know wanting to be on camera, it's really subsided. And the, the thing about the voice world, which a lot of people don't realize, for a lot of people like, you know, they, they say it in a lot in a less nice way than you put it like, oh, do you really miss being on camera? That's so sad. I'm like, no, no, it's not <laughs> sad. And I'm actually quite fulfilled. And the great thing about voice work, and I've talked about this before is, as, a, as an on-camera actor, Ben, you're used to, when you're auditioning for something, the second you walk in that room, you, before you speak a word, Your audition half, the, started. Half, the half the decision's already made. Yep. Forget that it started. They're already looking and going like, nope, that's not our guy. Well, let's let him finish his audition because he hasn't even spoken yet, so let's get through this. So you're used to being judged by this instantly before mm -hmm. you said word one. The great thing about the voice world is 
you know, you're sending an audition remotely for the most part, or they're hearing a recorded audition that you did, and they're judging you just on how you sound. So I can look like this and still talk like this and sound like, you know, come on, guys, let's go. So for, to a great extent, I could still sound like a teenager, maybe a little creepy. No. So, I mean, I'm still playing like, you know, teens and young 20s characters looking like this. So it's great to have that, that anonymity mm-hmm. and the, the illusion of being able to play any role that you can sound like. The only hard part is that we, I also see the voice world transitioning now where when you're close to getting a gig, they want to bring you in in person to meet you. And then before they give you the role of this animated show. And I'm like, oh, and my agent said, well, you know, you're, you're like one of the final guys they're interested in. Why don't you want to go in? I was like, not really. And it's not because I don't want to go in. It's because once they see me, the illusion of just hearing me and yeah. closing their eyes and visualizing that character goes, yes, it goes this away. sounds like it's completely gone. Now they're looking yeah. at me saying, you know, somehow you don't sound like that teenager anymore. And you want to say to yourself, no, close your eyes. It's just once you see me, there's a disconnect between the 50-something-year-old dude you're looking at with gray and thinning hair and that young voice that you're hearing. Yeah. So once, once you're in there in person and that illusion is no longer there, that becomes problematic. So I'm always grateful when they don't bring you in at the last minute or, or if you have casting people, producers, studios that know you already, that know your age, that know what you look like and know the range – that you can play and are comfortable with you voicing their characters, you know, that's great. But when they, when it's people that don't know you or are new to the business, they want to see you, there is that disconnect and it can become problematic as an older actor that does younger voices. But for the most part, it's been amazing in terms, I've been very fortunate that I'm still working in voiceover and I'm, I'm loving it. And I love that I get to play characters that I would never get to play if it was me on camera. You know, yeah. so um, I've been very fortunate that I was able to make that transition and that I can still, if I wanted to transition back and go back to doing on camera stuff, if that's something that I wanted to do, uh, it's there, thankfully. And I, I'd like to think that I have enough a rep- reputation, enough of a resume where I could step back into that world. But I'm really happy doing the voice work. It's, it's nice to be content in yes. what, what you're already doing Absolutely. and not have it's to so worry about that if you decide to go back to that and it doesn't work out, you still have Correct. everything that you're... And, and it's still satisfying, Ben. I mean, acting is acting, whether it's just your voice, whether it's you're mixed in with visuals and your voice. At the end of the day, if you can act and you can, you know, because again, there's some parts of voice acting that are almost more challenging because with voiceover, with animation, they don't have, well, with voiceover in general, they don't, with animation, they will see the character's face and the expressions. But just straight voiceover, they're not seeing your face or just hearing your voice. And you have to sort of convey all that emotion, whatever you're trying to convey, with your voice, without the luxury of having people see that face all the time. So there are challenges there and feelings of accomplishment and character work that you get to do that it's really exciting and really fulfilling. So no, I never, I feel, I know you didn't ask this, but no, I don't feel like I miss it or there's a loss, like, oh man, now I just have to settle for this. I don't feel like it's settling. And thankfully, I still have enough things that are on TV and in movies and streaming that I'm still out there. So I sort of get the best of both worlds, even though I'm not doing a lot of new on-camera stuff. My stuff is still out there, you know, because yeah. I've been fortunate enough to do stuff that has some legs, as I said before. So I'm, I'm a pretty happy dude. Yeah, and I always enjoy talking to people that do voiceover too. And me, and we'll talk a little bit more about this in detail once we're done the recording and everything. I'll, right. I'll share some more details with you. But I mean, I've like I've done some on camera work, like I've done background in a couple shows and things like right. that. Never any speaking roles or anything like that, um, or anything, and never any speaking roles that actually made it into the project. Right. Um, you know, into the final cut of anything. Everything I've ever done where I've spoken has been so minimal that it always makes the cutting room floor. Um, but I always said, like, if I ever was successful as an actor, I would never consider my character complete until I got to at, do the voice of an animated character. That's, you know, and that's, and it made people start to say, like, well, maybe you should start exploring voiceover because that seems like more of what you'd be into. And to me, the more I think about it, the more fun it seems like to do voiceover than on camera. Because I think one of the things that with me, like, if I'm doing, like, say I'm hanging out with my friends and they have, like, a two- or three-year-old kid. I'm just goofing off making different voices for Wait, these ben, kids. Yeah, hold that thought. Have you ever had anybody pause doing one of these because they had to hit the head? Dude, I have a bladder the size of a peanut. Go for it. And if I don't go right now, <laughs> stay right there. Hold that thought. Go for it. This is awesome. This is going to make for the best podcast ever. <laughs> to go to the bathroom. <laughs> <sighs> Was that a first? 
Uh, first person to ever break to use the bathroom. I've had people break because they've had people like delivering packages to their door, so they had to go get the package and and such. Oh no, that was that was yeah that one. And I was trying to time it. I was like, you know, I felt it coming on. Um, <laughs> this is like real stuff. This is like yeah yeah. Boy, that Mitchell Whitfield really feels comfortable talking to Ben about anything. And I knew it's like okay, I don't want to interrupt him. Now my dog wants. Do you want to go back out there? Okay, you can go back in. Come on. Come on. Go back out there. Come on. Good boy, Jakey. Of course, he'll start barking him and I'll know I changed my mind. So anyway, <laughs> please, please continue about, you know, so you wouldn't have felt complete unless you got to voice the animated version. Yeah, I, I like I was saying, like, if I, I, would, I wouldn't feel like my career was complete unless I got to do the voice of an animated character. I mean, and that's when friends started telling me, well, like, maybe you should start exploring voiceover because that seems more of what you would be into. And to me, it almost seemed like it would be something that would be a little bit more fun at the same time. Because, I mean, say I'm hanging out with friends, like, and I'm like, right. I'm making goofy voices and, th and, and stuff like that to like their two or three year old kid. I'm making them laugh, right. I'm making their parents laugh, you know, whatever. And it's just me goofing off. To me, like I'm, I'm, I'm doing it because I'm in a comfortable situation where, like, I know I'm making weird faces when I'm making these noises. But right, if I were to do that on camera, I would almost feel a little insecure about doing stuff like that. But if I was doing it in a studio behind a microphone, I, I would feel completely comfortable doing it because there's nobody watching me except maybe a couple of producers and some board operators. You know what? I never. That's that's an interesting way to look at it, Ben. Because I never thought about that. It's a. It really is freeing in a way for people that don't feel comfortable being looked at while they're performing, mm -hmm. um, or being judged, or like, oh, am I going to make this face? Because, like, like you said, when you're doing animated stuff, I I never want to see. There have been times where there's been a camera on me, whether whether doing motion caption or they want to animate the, around my face, or, and I'm thinking, oh, I don't like the camera on me when I'm doing this, which is funny because I made my living for many years in front of the camera. <laughs> yeah. When it comes to voice work, you know, you're trying to get this voice out and you're, you know, you're probably looking very unattractive. I'm talking about myself, not you. Um, so I oh, get no, that. I'd be there I too. It's that. fine. Of course. But you know what? For people that are just self-conscious in general on any level, but they want to perform, the voice world is kind of liberating in that way because you're letting everything out. You're having that full emotional run, but you're not worried about being judged visually. It's just going by the sound of your voice, which is really, really cool. I never thought about that aspect of it, you know? Yeah. I mean, cause it's another thing that I've told people too, that like, I've, I've always had this weird bucket list dream, like being in Philadelphia and, you know, with being a sports city with, you know, the, the, the Phillies and the Flyers and, and the Eagles, I've, I've always kind of said, like, it's kind of a bucket list dream of mine to be a mascot for a day. And I have friends at like, like, awesome. like, why would you do that? Like, because I could do anything I wanted, like being goof off, like goof off as much as I wanted. And, and it's like, not you. And play with people and nobody sees me. They see the mascot. So I don't have to worry about being insecure in just being goofy for, uh, you know, a three hour baseball game or something like that, because they're not looking at me. They're looking at the fanatic or they're looking at whatever mascot I'm portraying. So it's kind of a freeing aspect that I could do what I want and not feel judged. Yeah, about. I get that. And you shouldn't feel self-conscious. You're fantastic. You look great. And doggone it, people <laughs> like you. I had to mix of Stuart Smiley. All yeah. right, Stuart Smiley. Yeah. Mix it in there. Yeah, mix it in a little bit. But you know, I get it. I get it. It makes sense. Yeah. So yeah, that's, that's great. So I mean, that's another reason why I like talking to voiceover people because I like getting inside the minds of like why they enjoy doing it. And it's nice to know that there's a lot of similar aspects as to, I mean, because in, in, in an aspect of it, podcasting really is voiceover work. I mean, yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a vocal medium. So, yep. you know, that's what's the most important part of it. The video is secondary. It's the conversation that you're having and the voice that you're, you're doing that's the, the main part of it. Um, well, I mean... I mean, I'll, I'll just jump in with like a one last thing because I've done some yeah. stuff on YouTube as well. And the funny thing about YouTube is, and people, it's going to sound counterintuitive, but it's absolutely true. When we were doing our first bunch of videos, people said, look, people will tolerate a video that doesn't look great. They won't tolerate a video that doesn't sound great. Yep. And it's funny when the, when the medium is visual, you rely on the sound to sort of guide you. 
You know, it's okay if you can't necessarily, if things visually don't look exactly as you want them to look, but if they don't sound good, so it sort of goes into what you were just saying. So yeah, the yeah. audio becomes a huge part. You can get very distracted if there's warbly audio. I mean, the picture uh, can be crystal clear, 1080p, 4K, whatever it is. But if that yep. audio is like warbly or echoey or something, yeah, it really takes you away from the moment of what you're watching. Yep. Um, Spend on your sound equipment, folks. It just, that's where it pays off the most. Yes, I completely agree. Uh, uh, any future projects that you're working on now that you kind of want to talk about and, and kind of get out there? I can't. The one that, the one that I'm walking, okay. working on right now, I'm doing a new uh, Disney series, Ooh, which is going to be right. on Disney Junior and I think Disney Plus, I think. I know it's on Disney Junior. I'm not allowed to talk about it yet. Okay. Um, but I will, I will be. I'll be back. I will be back. <laughs> And we'll be able to talk about it soon. Anything else that's going on? No, I just want to talk more board games with you, man. What is wrong with me? Oh, wait, What is wrong with me? That all I'd want to do is talk board games with you. Is that sad? No, not at all. I mean, we can definitely, we'll talk a little bit more after the recording's over. Oh, yeah, um, I'm surrounded by all these great games. But no, no, the, in terms of work, <laughs> um, I might be starting something here. I also have one of these cameras. It's now, it's now in follow it's, mode. It's following you, yeah. Yeah, but I have to, I could turn that off too. Um, I might be starting something else later in the year, but for right now, it's that one Disney show that I'm not allowed to talk about. Uh, but otherwise, you know, you can find me on a streaming service near you or on the Instagrams and on the interwebs. Um, before we wrap it up, yes. uh, this being a movie and television theme podcast, I, I got to ask, this is going forward. This is how I'm trying to end all my conversations that I have with people. Uh, okay. and, and being the end of the year, this is the perfect opportunity to do it. Uh, what's one movie and or television series you really, really enjoyed seeing this year? And what's mm -hmm. one you're looking forward to seeing coming up? Oh, wow. That's a great question. Um, I, I very much, I very much enjoyed the MCU over the past couple of years. Um, all the Marvel shows are really in the way they craft all these shows to intertwine, mm -hmm. um, whether it be Loki, She-Hulk. I mean, there are so many great things coming from the, you know, Marvel Cinematic Universe. I really, really enjoyed it. And I'm very much looking forward to seeing how they tie together more. And I think I talked about this on a podcast a little while back, especially how they tied in Daredevil with She-Hulk. So I've really That's been so enjoying good. that. It's so good, and I, I really like that version that they were sort of Daredevil, uh, the less dark, grim, being beaten to a pulp every episode version. Um, so I'm really interested to see how that continues and how sort of the, the TV shows influence the cinematic world as well. I've very much been enjoying that. And I'm looking forward to that. Same thing with Star Wars, um, all owned by the same company. Yeah. Um, of course, <laughs> I, 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 this is going to be sad. I, I also look forward to my rewatch of Grimm coming up in the next couple of weeks and my rewatch of fringe, which is happening as well. And now since we talked, I'm going to have to do Chuck all over again yeah, too. I have to do but a I'm Chuck trying to think of their, Oh God. Uh, I'm trying to think <laughs> what other series that I've been watching aside from uh, the Marvel and star Wars stuff. That's a really cool. I have to think about this some more okay. right now. I'll stick with the MCU and the star Wars universe and, and my, my three staples, grim fringe and Chuck, which sounds like a highly dysfunctional law firm. <laughs> so there you go. Uh, do you, do any of the Disney plus series stand out as a favorite from the MCU? Cause I have a favorite. I mean, I've, I've been a fan of all of them so far, you know, from moon Knight and she Hulk and everything, but right. My, in my personal opinion, from all of the shows I've seen so far, which I've seen them all, um, Hawkeye really stood out as one of my favorites. It I was think. so different, and people did not know what to expect. And it I was think grounded. it was different than people. It was that it was a it was a more realistic. Yes, and of course, but also you were talking about one of the few heroes, superheroes in the MCU that's a human with no superpowers whatsoever. It's just a skill. So, it's a skill. Yeah. Um, and even even Daredevil, who was more grounded, you know, he he did have powers. He does have powers. So. You know, Hawkeye is well, Hawkeye is one of doesn't, so I think he's grounded in a more human way just by nature of his humanity. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, no. The way it, that, it's, it, and it's a relationship story. It was a relationship story. It was and, an action I, show, but it was a relationship story. And what I really appreciate about it, about the, the series, too, is like we, you know, mentioned the being a ground, it being grounded and it being a relationship between, you know, these two characters. But at the same time, I loved how it focused on the one thing they showed heroes could have, and that's PTSD. Because oh, yeah. he, he was going through the PTSD of all the events that happened 
from right. you know from the Infinity Wars, from the battle with Thanos and everything, and the we guilt haven't... of being someone who survived, like survivors guilt. Yes, yeah. Which is, so, I mean, these are these are real things, and that's why, like you said, it's grounded in some real issues. And you know, it was you know, I think that and Loki were the two most surprising shows that I really enjoyed. That I didn't know going in how much I was actually going to like them. Mm -hmm. um, but I totally agree with you. I think Hawkeye was brilliant. Yeah. And it takes place in New York City at Christmas, which is oh. like one of my favorite places and favorite times of the year. So yes, yeah. that's my hometown. So, you know, you got me there. Any anytime something shot in New York, you always have my my attention. So yeah. Yeah, exactly. Especially at Christmas. It's like there's just something special about New York City at Christmas. Like it doesn't matter It's magical. It, it doesn't matter like crime or anything like that. It's just when you when you go to and when you're standing at Rockefeller Center and you're looking at the tree or you're you're walking down Fifth Avenue or the it's just there's just something magical about New York at Christmas time that I, I just oh, I, love yeah, I, I grew up at the end of Fifth Avenue, about right by Washington Square Park. That's where I grew up. So I would make that walk from Rock Rockefeller Center in the winter and I'd walk down the forty something blocks to my apartment down on eighth street. So I remember that walk and I remember the cold and you know, I, I just, it's, it really is magical. Yellow snow and all New York <laughs> in the winter time is one of the most magical places you could, did I ruin it for you? It's no. probably one of the most magical places you can go at the most magical time of the year. So yeah, yeah I'm with you. Exactly. Uh, where can people find you on socials if they want to follow you? I don't know if it's uh, Mitchell.Whitfield on, Inst on Instagram, if it's M underscore, I think Twitter might be M underscore Whitfield, but I do more stuff on Instagram right now. And I'll post some stuff about it. And I think that's Mitchell.Whitfield at Instagram. But um, I tend to, don't get horrified. I talk <laughs> about my acting world and all that stuff, but I also do a lot of stuff on board games and just geeky stuff that give me joy. So it's sort of a combination of like my regular life mixed in with a little bit of the acting world and a little bit of the pop culture stuff. So yeah, I think people, when they sign up, when they you know become a father, they're like, why isn't he talking more about movies and TV? Why is he showing this board game? Why I, do I care? Because it's a great game. I so, think yeah, that's all the uh, more reason people should be following you on Instagram. Thank you, right? It's because of the geeky, like your your personal geeky love, not just the television aspect. It's the things that give me joy. And at the end of the day, I think that's why you follow people anyway, because you'll see the things that give them joy. And hopefully it'll be similar stuff that gives you joy. Because, you know, it'd be easy. I think maybe I would still be doing more movies and TV if I'd you know, been <laughs> more self-promoting. I know you could use it to self-promote on, on Instagram and Twitter and anywhere, TikTok, wherever you want to do it, your platform of choice. But for me, it's more about, you know, I didn't want it to become a job. I just wanted to just occasionally post stuff that either made me laugh or made me smile or gave me joy. You know, whether that's my family in Hawaii and a little picture in Hawaii or, you know, like the new board or I just posted today my new Xbox controller. This, this, is, this is who I am. This is who I am. <laughs> that sounded really good. Wow. I should do voice work. That's why you're in. Oh, I was going to say that's why you're in voice work, but your, <laughs> yours, exactly. yours was better. <laughs> uh, but Mitchell, I know I've taken up enough of your time for, for tonight no, for this great. conversation. Uh, I I, I mean, I hope I get you. I hope you you come back on in the future. We got to talk anytime Chuck. you want. Yeah, I, I I appreciate that so much. Um, I love that Jill. Shout out to Jill one more time for making the connection. Yes, the thank you, Jill. I miss you already. Uh, for doing this. Uh, but to everybody out there who's watching or listening, uh, thank you so much for a great year. Again, this was the final episode of 2022. We'll be back in January of 2023 with all new episodes. Follow on the socials, wilhelmpodcast.com to subscribe to the podcast. And of course, follow on Facebook, facebook.com slash wilhelmpodcast and Instagram at wilhelmpodcast. Mitchell, thank you one more time for coming on. This was so much fun. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it.